Thank you so much for being here. Second day of Africa Rights 2021. Celebrating imagination, pleasure, activism. It's been an incredible two days. So many, many thanks for joining us, uh, all of you here and also all of you online. Just a few notes before we start. We'll be taking questions online um, from our online and from you. So if you're watching online, submit your questions using the question box below the video. And here, just put your hand up and a microphone will find its way to you. Please turn off your mobile phones or put them on silence. Um, we're not expecting any fire alarms this evening. So if one happens, it's real. And please make your way out uh, safely um, following the emergency exit signs. Um, we are in for a treat, our headline event, Dismantling the Patriarchy, with Mona El Tahawi in conversation with Dr. Leila Hussein. Um, we will be, they will be discussing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Award-winning American Egyptian journalist, activist, and author Mona El Tahawi concludes our festival with the special headline events to discuss the seven necessary sins for women and girls. So we are in for a treat. Um, you can also get Africa Rights merchandise, including uh, with Mona's The Revolution Is Not Polite. So just check the tables outside for that. And uh, there's a QR code. We would love to have your feedback. It's really, really important for us. So please just get the QR codes and give us some feedback uh, for the event. We'd really appreciate it. And uh, with no further ado, we please welcome to the stage Mona Tahawi, Dr. Lila Hussain. Take a picture because this is really special. <laughs> we're like, we're super excited that we see people in a room. Actually, before we start, this is our first physical event for us, so we we're just excited the fact that there are people in the room with us. I think this has been like cancelled a few times, so I'm really happy that you are actually my first person I'm, I'm seeing. And I'm we're seeing. wearing shoes. We're wearing shoes again. Why we're walking very slowly because it's like, what is this on my foot? We're wearing shoes again. We're wearing bras again. <laughs> we're, wearing, we're wearing bottoms again. So it's, it, it took me a while to get dressed up for this today. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody who's, uh, who's here today. Because, you know, we have been on lockdown for nearly two years. And thanks to those who have joined us online. Uh, please remember to... Um, <clears throat> Please remember to follow us on Africa Rights UK. Uh, make sure you use the hashtag. I'm sure you've been told a few times today. So thank you, everybody, uh, uh, for being here today. So um, I thought we need to set the tone a little bit. And in true Mona fashion, I think, let, let me tell a quick story. I met Mona a couple of years ago in Oslo. And I mean, I read about her work many, many times. I actually went up to her and said, oh my God, I really loved your article, Why They Hate Us. You know, I remember reading that article um, just, and I met you a few months after that. And Mona comes on stage and says, hello everybody, my name is Mona al -Tahawi. I'm a Muslim woman and I like to fucking drink. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh. I said, okay, so there's a lot of people like that that exist. Okay then, that's good. <laughs> And in a true, you know, in a true Mona uh, statement, I would like to declare my faith, fuck the patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> so Mona, so before we start, I'm gonna, um, oh my God, we haven't done this in so long. I'm like, oh my God, I need to look at notes again. <laughs> so I would like to uh, 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 set the tone by actually reading a little blurb about Mona's book, uh, Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls a bold, uncompromising feminist manifesto on how we defy, disrupt, destroy the patriarchy. I hope you heard that. <laughs> what would the world look like if girls were taught there were volcanoes whose eruptions were a thing of beauty, a power to behold? Thank you, Mona, for really creating this manifesto that will hopefully make sure. I think people keep saying women and girls should have this book. I think everyone should have this book. Because I think in order to end patriarchy, we need to start where it began, with men. I think that's the root of this problem. So before we get into our conversation, I would like to invite on stage, um, I would like to invite Laura Hanna, an, uh, an Egyptian-British 
actor and writer who's going to read a, um, a little, uh, apart from uh, um, Mona's book on profanity, the section on profanity. Can I invite Laura? Hi. This is also uh, this is also feels quite new for me <laughs> after years in lockdown. So it's really lovely to be back. Um, uh, first to say, it's an absolute privilege to be able to voice some of Mona's uh, words. I, I was asked to do this a couple of days ago and got sent uh, the text and started reading her introduction and immediately felt very emotional and very energised. And the first thought I had was. I wish I had had this book when I was 12. Like, I would wish I'd had this book 20 years ago. I needed it then, but I still need it now. And, um, and after today, I will be buying it for my mum and my sister, because even at 69, my mum needs to be reading these words. So um, I'm going to read an extract from chapter three, Profanity. Uncle Sam, I want to know what you're doing with my fucking tax money. Because I'm from New York and the streets is always dirty. We was voted the dirtiest city in America. There are still rats on the damn trains. I, I know you're not spending it on no damn prison because you'll uh, be giving black folk like two underwears, one jumpsuit for like five months. What is you all doing with my fucking money? I want to know. I want receipts. I want everything. Cardi B. <laughs> my name is Mona al -Tahawi. And this is my declaration of faith. Fuck the patriarchy. Whenever I stand at a podium to give a lecture, I begin with that declaration of faith. Whether I am speaking on a panel on feminism in front of an audience of a thousand in Lahore, Pakistan, at a summit for activists and politicians working to end violence against women and children in Dublin, Ireland, on a stage as part of an evening of multi-generational African feminists in Johannesburg, South Africa, or at a lunch for medical students in New York City, USA, my declaration never changes. I could say dismantle the patriarchy, or smash the patriarchy, or use any number of verbs that signal urgency, but I don't. I am a writer and I understand how language works. I understand how audiences, and readers react to the language I use. I know exactly what I am doing. And I say, fuck the patriarchy, because I am a woman, a woman of color, a Muslim woman. And I am not supposed to say, fuck. In my experience, almost nothing can match the power of profanity delivered by a woman at a podium unapologetically. Because how many women, not to mention women of colour, Muslim women, or working class women, or, 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 are ever even invited to the podium? And of those, how many, when they get on stage, still speak as if they are asking for permission to speak? I have lost count of the number of times that I've heard women on a panel preface every contribution as if our right to speak is an imposition. Uh, as if our contribution is a burden, as if our thoughts are secondary or tertiary even to the discussion at hand. How many times do you hear a woman dismiss or diminish her right to comment on an issue by saying, I'm not an expert, but uh, how many times are women interrupted, spoken over and spoken for? We must recognize that the ubiquitous ways patriarchy has socialized women to shrink themselves physically and intellectually extend also into language, into what we can and cannot say. It is not just a fight for airtime. It is not just a policing of women's egos. It polices women's very language. At the heart of that policing, standing guard over our language like a baton ready to strike, is a concept that seems deceptively simple. Civility. When Donald Trump was elected, many truths that white Americans were oblivious to, willingly or naively, were forced onto their consciousness. It was impossible to deny that racism was a driving force behind his election, and yet analysts and pundits insisted it was the suffering working class, read white working class, and economic anxiety, as if people of colour who were working class were immune from suffering or economic anxiety. Many white Americans exclaimed, this is not an America I know. 
precisely because they had refused to or had never had to come face to face with that racism. And Trump's shameless expression of racism and bigotry finally forced some of them to see that America. Those of us who are not white and who have experienced that racism all too well have long known that America. Denial and gaslighting, the latter a form of psychological abuse that aims to make someone doubt their own thoughts, beliefs and perceptions, went on full throttle as talking heads, politicians, media and others went out of their way to blame everything but racism for Trump's success at the polls. Moreover, those of us who insisted on calling racism what it was, rather than by a series of euphemisms, were urged not to call a racist a racist, and we were instructed to be civil when arguing with Trump supporters. For the sake of unity, free speech and healing, civility was held up as paramount. The obsession with civility, no matter what, was at times bipartisan, as when both Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, a Democrat, and Congressman Steve Scalise, a Republican, both of whom are white, criticised Maxine Waters, a black Democratic Congresswoman, for encouraging her supporters to protest Trump administration officials in public wherever they saw them. But paramount for whom? Who does civility serve? Racism is not civil. Racism is not polite. And yet, here were all those people lined up to insist that we be civil when talking about Trump and his supporters. Those people lined up to insist on civility were, of course, white. For white Americans who have no experience of racism, it is a concept, a theory, an idea to be debated, and not a lived reality to be endured or survived. Fuck that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and that's just a little taster of that <laughs> manifesto. And, and what was so interesting, is I, I didn't know the part Laura was actually going to read. And before she walked into the green room that we were at, Mona and I were having a very deep conversation on why we love Cardi B so much. She's one of my feminist icons, just putting that out there. <laughs> Another thing to declare. So Mona, you know, you're an award-winning uh, journalist, you know, activist, commentator. I mean, your work has been featured in New York Times, The Washington Post, The Guardian, Time. I mean, the list goes on. I really absolutely, if, if you haven't followed Mona, then something's wrong with you. So I think you, you need to start um, uh, uh, making sure that you follow a lot of her work, especially her tweets are very interesting. Uh, what was it in the morning you start with? Solidarity and... Starting my day and sending love and solidarity. solidarity. And then the fuck patriarchy follows up <laughs> just after that. So I definitely recommend you do that. So this book, it's a follow-up to your last book, which was The Headscarves and Hymens, uh, Why the Middle East Needs Sexual Revolution. So you can see the amount of work you've been creating uh, leading up to this. So, so let me give you a list of the seven sins that we need to be committing is anger, Attention, profanity, ambition, power, violence, and lust. So those are the seven things we need to be committing as women and girls. So my first question to you, Mona, is you've talked about, I mean, in, in the time I've known you and, and, and following your work for the last few years, and this is something I can absolutely relate to, it's I, a lot of my work stems from an anger that I had and I would like you to maybe unpack a little bit why anger has fueled a lot of your work. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Leila. It's a thrill and an honor to be in conversation with you because you are a sister comrade, and I'm so happy that we're sitting on the stage together for our first in-person event. I want to thank Marcel and Nat and the whole team at Africa Rights for doing such a great job with the festival. And when they asked me to do this, I was like, my first in-person event, I'm so glad. <laughs> And so thank you, thank you, Marcel and Matt and the whole team, thank you. And I wanna start with my usual start, but I'm gonna add something to it. So my name is Mona Altahawi. My pronouns are she, her, and I begin everything as I always do, and it's such a delight to begin it in person rather than to yell into a Zoom hole. <laughs> <laughs> because I love it when I say it in person. This is my declaration of faith. Fuck the patriarchy. Finally, in person. 
But I also want to take time out to recognize why this is my first person, uh, my first in-person event. It is, of course, because of the pandemic. And I want us to take a minute and reflect because many of us in this room come from communities who have most been affected by the pandemic in terrible ways, in ways that we must all insist we never go back to this normal. Fuck normal, because normal is what brought us here. The day I left to come to London, one of my aunts in Cairo died. She was my dad's second sibling to die in three months in COVID-related circumstances. My uncle died in August, a cousin of mine died in April, and my beloved's father died last year in May. So everybody in this room has been affected. Mm -hmm. And to you all, I give my love and solidarity. And I want us to remember that in this country, as the same in the United States, there are fascist fucks who don't care that the people most affected by the pandemic are black people, people of color, working class people, disabled people, and the most vulnerable and marginalized. So fuck going back to normal, never go back to normal. <laughs> Ensure that you destroy that normal because every single person in this room has either lost someone or know someone affected by that normal. And I wanted to start with that because it's really important to remember mm -hmm. why we're here. Yep. And secondly, this um, is my first, as I keep saying, my first in-person event since March 6, 2020. And that last event was an event in New York City by a really dear friend of mine, an Egyptian drag queen called Anna Masreya, whose name translates into I am an Egyptian woman. <laughs> and her event in New York is called Nefertiti's. <laughs> <laughs> and there was an Egyptian drag queen, a Palestinian drag queen, and a Mexican drag queen. And um, Anna Masreya asked me to speak as an Egyptian feminist giant. And the theme of my talk was, the revolution is my cunt. <laughs> so I promise you an evening full of profanity. I'm, I'm taking notes, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so having started in that somber note where I urge you to remember <laughs> to fuck normal, I also want you to remember that the revolution is my cunt. <laughs> and, and, in opposition to JK Rowling and Margaret Atwood and all the other powerful people who are transphobic fucks, I want to remind people. I want to emphasize that cunts do not just belong to cis women and that I am gender inclusive of all my gender non-conforming comrades. Fuck transphobia. All right. So, what were you asking me? No, <laughs> no anger. No, so anger. You know, this anger, was all yeah. part so of the anger. My question was... Is anger. I, yeah. I remember, I remember. Oh, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> so look, anger is the first sin of the seven mm. necessary sins mm -hmm. because I, I want to tell you about an anecdote that happened when I was four years old that I talk about in the book. I was four years old, little girl in Cairo, talking to a friend of mine across the street, each of us speaking to each other from the balcony. And I was so tiny that I had to stand on a stool so I could see my friend across the railing of the balcony. And these two little girls are having a great time. And this car pulls over, and a man gets out of the car, and he pulls out his penis and waves it at two little girls. I was so tiny, like I said, I, I had to stand on a stool to look over the balcony. So at first I was like, I hid, I hid from the man. And then I stood up on the stool again, and he was still there, and he was beckoning me and my friend to go down. So I picked up my slipper, because in Egypt, I mean, Egyptians in the room will know what the slipper is. <laughs> <Shib -shib. laughs> I picked up my ship ship, right? And I waved it at this man, because I was convinced that my anger would terrify him. This four-year-old girl understood that something really awful was happening. This fucking piece of shit was doing something really bad, and he deserved to be punished, and I was the one who was gonna punish him. A four-year-old girl believed that she had the power to punish this fucking piece of shit. Why? Why did I believe that? Because girls, just like boys, are born with what I call a pilot light of rage. You know, like in the oven you have a pilot light, if you have a gas oven, and you turn that pilot light on when you wanna start 
baking or cooking or whatever, right? We all are born with that pilot light, but we snuff out that pilot light in girls. Because there's four-year-old me convinced I could terrify this guy. But when I was 15, so fast forward nine years later, my family is at pilgrimage in Mecca. We had just moved to Saudi Arabia from the UK. And I was sexually assaulted twice during Hajj. Who the fuck goes on pilgrimage to sexually assault someone? Once by someone who was probably a fellow pilgrim and then a second time by a Saudi policeman next to the Kaaba towards which we pray five times a day. By that stage, at 15 years of age, I burst into tears and I could not say a fucking word. I couldn't even tell my parents what happened. I was so ashamed. So this is where anger comes in. Mm -hmm. Because I, I quote studies in my book that show you that by the age of 10, 10, girls around the world, regardless of where you live, because the study was north, south, east, west, by the age of 10, girls had accepted and believed that they were weak and vulnerable. So that's what happened. At four, I am convinced I could terrify this man. <laughs> At 15, I am crying and ashamed mm. about something that happened to me. So this is why anger is important because anger is the fuel. Audrey Lord, the black lesbian and intellectual and poet, Audrey Lord described anger as the fuel to the engine. It's not the only thing that you need. And that's why anger is what I call the junior sin. I begin the seven sins with anger, but you need much more. But when you snuff out that pilot light of rage, you have, you've turned us into the 15 year old who cannot even speak what happened to her. So we have to start, first of all, we have to leave girls alone. I, I don't want us to teach girls to be angry. They know how to be angry. Mm. We have to stop unlearning the anger the from them. What you're describing is conditioning. So being conditioned Socialized. from age of four to 15, because by the time you're 15, you have been conditioned to Talk not speak up. If you say anything, you're the one who's feeling the shame, the guilt, and that's what you're describing your experience was. Exactly yeah. that. Yeah. So, so I want us to tell girls that being angry is as important as being honest. You know, we teach mm. children to be honest, right? Mm. Continue to teach girls that their anger is a vital, vital thing, as vital as being honest. Can I, can, can I push a little bit in terms of when we talk about anger, can we talk about women of colour? Because that's a whole different context. Mm -hmm. Because I know from being a black woman, whenever I go into a room, I'm either going to have to edit what I'm saying, or if I don't say it, I'm a cold bitch. And if I express my passion and views, I'm an angry black woman. Mm -hmm. And how, can you explain a little bit what that be. You know, I think it, it's really instructive to also, at this point, explain what patriarchy is, mm -hmm. yep. how patriarchy works and how it fits into what you're saying. Yep. When I talk about patriarchy, people think it's a man. You know, they're like, who is this patriarchy? Tell me where he is so I can go there and, like, fucking destroy him. <laughs> like, okay, go destroy Boris Johnson, go destroy Donald Trump, but patriarchy is still going to be there. Mm -hmm. So patriarchy is not about one man. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy is not men. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy is so all around us and everywhere, it's like asking a fish, what is water? Yeah. When you ask a fish, what is water? The fish is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what is <I> water? It. <laughs> it's everything, you know? Yeah. So the definition then becomes patriarchy is a system of oppressions that privilege male dominance. Again, right over people's heads. Mm -hmm. So I've come up with an analogy that I hope helps. I want you to imagine an octopus. The head of the octopus is patriarchy. And each one of the eight tentacles is one of those oppressions that together are that system that works to privilege male dominance. It also works to privilege what I call foot soldiers of the patriarchy who are not necessarily men. Yep. So what are those tentacles? Mm -hmm. The tentacles are, mostly depending on where you live, white supremacy, capitalism, misogyny, homophobia, ableism, ageism, transphobia, all the isms, yeah? <laughs> and I want you to imagine the person who is most strangled by those eight tentacles. Because when you imagine that person most strangled by the eight tentacles and how we can cut off all those tentacles to liberate that person, when that person is free, we are all free. So, and this isn't humanism, because people often say to me, you're just talking about humanism. No, no, I insist that we go about chopping off the tentacles as feminists. Because it, this, this is a fight that is driven 
by gender and sexuality in a very feminist way. So this is to answer your question, Leila, because you're talking now about women of color and our access to anger. Because, you know, when Donald Trump became president, white women suddenly discovered their anger. I was like, well, fucking hello. <laughs> about fucking time, you know? Hello. Join the train. I've yes. been angry since I was four, you know? Where have you been? So, and they... The, and the thing about white women accessing, accessing anger and all these countless books about rage and anger and I don't know what, is that they were the ones who had the most privilege and should have been angry a long, long That's time ago. And though, because, because they are the least affected, now obviously they're affected by misogyny, but when you look at all the other tentacles that will ensnare you mm -hmm. and will ensnare me, we have much more at stake. Which, which is why, you know, you, there are books about white feminism and all of that, and I call it bespoke feminism, a feminism that fits just the person who it's designed to fit. So this is why it's so difficult for us as, you know, you as a black woman, me as a woman of color, because we have all of those other tentacles and we don't have the privilege to not be angry. And so I, I ask people who have the privilege, because after a while it does become a privilege, you know? So yes, we're gonna be called angry black women, we're gonna be called a bitch, we're gonna be called all of that. Let them call us what they want to call us because anger is a power, anger is an energy. And when I look at the, those tentacles and the octopus that I'm talking about, it's a reminder too to men, because patriarchy is not men, that I want something much more than equality with them. because. When you look at that octopus, black men are not free. Mm -hmm. Working class men are not free. Gay men are not free. Trans men are not free. Disabled men are not free. So I am not going, first of all, I don't want to be equal to someone who's not free. Mm. I want to be free. Yeah. Second of all, I am not going to wait for unfree men to unfree me. <laughs> hmm? Amen to that. Oh my God. Right? Yes. <laughs> So, I want to be free. I don't want to be equal to unfree men. And so I want all the, especially the cis men in the room, to understand that the octopus hurts you too. Absolutely. So join the feminist fight and say fuck the patriarchy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, just a reminder for the audience and those watching us online, please, those watching us, you can send your questions um, through to, uh, obviously, from the live streaming. And please prepare your questions. Uh, somebody would, will be coming with the mic. And I've been told the mic will be sanitized. See, these are the kind of things you have to say as chair now, which is interesting. So I want to take us maybe on the other side of the sin now, because I, I think one, one, when I was um, preparing for this, I thought, which, which were the most important things? So anger was one of them, that's why I asked that question. But the other one, it's lust. Mm. So why is that a necessary sin right. for women and girls? I think that's, that's something that's, really kept away from us very early on. Absolutely. Well, you yeah. know, you started with what I call the junior sin, which is anger. Yeah. And you're now asking me about the most senior sin. Yeah. Because I've arranged the sins yeah. in order of importance and difficulty. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say anger is like the easiest one, you know, and, and you can't stop there. Now, lust is the most difficult because, you know, mm -hmm. it goes through that progression that you read, you know, anger, attention, profanity, mm -hmm. ambition, power, violence, lust. And lust, I, I approach lust I, personally because for me, so I was born to an Egyptian Muslim family and this isn't specific to Egyptians or Muslims because it's, it's in so many other countries. And you know, I've lived in the US since 2000 and it's definitely there at the heart of what is known as purity culture. So I was raised to wait, to wait before I had sex and lose my virginity and all these other, other terms which I now reject utterly because we lose nothing when we have sex, and in writing my book, in writing Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs the Sexual Revolution, and in writing The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls, and more recently, my newsletter, Feminist Giant, I've really seriously began to assess the language that I use when I talk about sex. Because I was socialized into waiting to have sex, but I began to masturbate when I was 11. I'm like, thank you, Mona. <laughs> because if I had started masturbating when I was 11, I would have lost my fucking mind, I tell you. <laughs> because I, I, I obeyed, I obeyed this weight. But now I say I waited to have sex with another person because I've been having sex with me and really great sex with me since I was 11. <laughs> so I, I believe we need to teach children just how wonderful and powerful and necessary masturbation is. And when the Surgeon General in the United States was saying that, she was fired for saying we need to teach children to masturbate. Mm. So 
Like reflect on the power of that, that when you teach a child that they own their sexuality, you could be fired from your job because patriarchy wants to own our sexuality. So lust became something that I really had to wrestle with mm. because I wanted to ask why did I wait mm. to lose my virginity, again, I lost nothing, and to have sex, sex with another person. See, so these are brackets now of my assessing the language until I was 29. Now before, I always tell people don't feel sorry for me because I have more than made up for lost time. <laughs> So, although I was feeling quite guilty at the beginning, I fucked the guilt out of my system. <laughs> and There's another tweet, everybody. <laughs> and also, you know, this thing about virginity, you know, like I've, I've been saying this, you've heard me say this before, Leila. You know, what the fuck is virginity? Why, and, and does it always include a penis in a vagina? What, what happens when other, place, other places of your body are accessed? Do you know what I mean? So I now, I have sex with men and sex with women. So exactly which part of someone's body, mm. along with my body, is going to qualify as sex? Do you know what I mean? Yep. So I have reassessed completely the ways that I was socialized to think about sex, which is why I put lust at the end. And I put lust at the end because lust was also the driving force behind why the Middle East needs a sexual revolution. Because mm. people often ask me, what is this sexual revolution you're talking about? And so I tell them, Lust is the most important sin, and the sexual revolution is the revolution we need because at the heart of that is the declaration, like I say, fuck the patriarchy, the declaration, I own my body. Because when you teach a child that the child owns their body, you get fired for it. And when I say I own my body, it means that I own it, not the state, not the church, not the mosque, not the street, not the home. I own my body. And through that declaration, I determine who I have sex with and when I have sex with them, again, always, always with their consent, obviously. But then I become the driver of my pleasure and of my joy. I'm also an anarchist and I'm also polyamorous. So I've taken all of these things. I'm 54 years old now. I spent a lot of time That's thinking about sex. That's why you look young. Sex. That's why I look very young. <laughs> oh, because I fuck a lot. Is there that what you're saying? Go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. no, but, but you know what, I've, I've, I've tried to be really honest about this stuff. So those of you who subscribe to Feminist Giant will know that my latest essay is about perimenopause and what it's been doing to my sex drive. And I'm like, okay, menopause, we need to fucking talk. What the fuck are you doing to my sex drive? <laughs> it's, it's those kind of honest conversations that we yeah. need to have so that we can talk about why, Absolutely. as women of color, we don't have access to anger, but also as people like, Basically, everyone who is not a cis man does not have access to our lust. And many cis men also don't have access to their lust, but they, they, they're in denial that they, that they think they have it. Just in the same way that the only emotion cis men are allowed is anger, cis men are also in, uh, delusional when they think that they own their lust in all the ways that they think they own it. So let's have those honest conversations. I'm standing on, I'm sitting on a stage here telling you things about my sex drive and I have sex with men and women and I've been masturbating since I was 11 because shame and silence for the longest time denied me my ability to say that. And when shame and silence happen, the most vulnerable people are hurt. And who are the most vulnerable people? Mostly anyone who is not a cis man. Mm -hmm. So fuck shame and fuck silence. If I, if I put my therapy hat on for a few seconds, um, for me, I'm always interested in process. So in terms of when you were writing this book, what was the process like for you? Because I can't imagine it was fun times ever as you were writing through this book. So maybe if you can describe what that process was like for you. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I think <clears throat> Headscarves and Hymens was much harder to write mm. because Headscarves and Hymens was basically the book form of why do they hate us? Yes. And there were so many times when I was writing, so Headscarves and Hymens is, is about the revolution in Egypt and the countries in the region and what happens when the revolution goes home and how we need a revolution that's a, about more than overthrowing the state because the state is not the only entity that oppresses us. The state, yes, oppresses everyone, but when you're someone who's not a cis man, it's the state along with the street, along with the home, what I call the trifecta of patriarchy or the trifecta of misogyny. And we need, because if the state oppresses everyone, the state, the street, and the home together 
mm -hmm. oppress women, oppress trans people, oppress queer people generally. And there were so many times when I was writing headscarves and hymens that I had to literally walk away from my computer because it was, it was visceral. There were just so many stories that I was writing about that, that, that were really difficult. Yeah. And then I wrote the chapter on, on bodies and sex and virginity and all of that basically on my parents' dinner table. My parents were sitting there watching TV and I'm sitting there writing about when I was 29, I finally had sex with another person going, oh my God, please don't read chapter six. Please don't read chapter six. <laughs> and I gave my parents my book and I said, look, I didn't write this book to hurt you. I love you very much. I wrote this book because this is my revolution, but here it is. And they're still talking to me, so. <laughs> no, and because and, and, I follow you on social media, I see your pictures with your dad. I mean, I think it's important to point out, you know, your sister wears the hijab. Oh, my mom, my hijab. sister. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's great that, you know, you, you, you're, you're being in a position where you can be open and feel safe, because I think that's really important too. You felt safe, that's, that's yeah. Well, well, look, I mean, it's important to also say that my parents, my family disagree with a lot of that, of course, what I yeah. say. You know, they don't agree with everything that I say. We've had our difficulties, you know, but we're still there. You know, we've, this is after many years of kind of like, you know, fighting it out. And not everyone, it, it's a massive privilege. Not everyone has that privilege, mm -hmm. and I recognize that. There are many people whose families have not fought it out with them in this way where they're still, they still feel loved. And, and for anyone in the room who is going through that, I, I give you, I offer you my love and solidarity because I know it's really difficult. And I know there isn't always love and acceptance. Absolutely. It's, it's, it, it is a revolution on many levels. So Headscarves and Hymens was much more difficult to write. Mm. Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. So if, if Headscarves and Hymens was about the revolution and patriarchy in Egypt and the surrounding countries, um, the Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls took my fight against patriarchy globally. Mm. And, and I did it because, and it was part of the process, because I got fed up of going into spaces where I had to preface everything I said by saying, you know what, I'm not here to tell you that where I come from is shit and where you're, yeah. where you're from is great. Because it's shit over here too. And I would have to remind them, it's shit over here too. I mean, Sarah Everard and what happened. And, mm. you, know, you know, policemen in Egypt broke my arms and sexually assaulted me a policeman in the UK arrested a woman mm. on false charges of breaking lockdown and raped and murdered her. So fuck the police everywhere. Mm. And it's shit everywhere. Mm. So, <laughs> thank you. So I took that fight, you know, against patriarchy in the region globally, because I wanted then to be able to sit in rooms around the world and say, look, I've got your receipts now. It's shit in the US, it's shit in China, it's yes. shit in France, it's shit everywhere because patriarchy is like water to a fish. So it was a much easier process. I was like, I don't have to constantly feel like I'm defending my people, you know? Absolutely. And, and I think that, that uh, just to follow up uh, from that statement, um, I think what you picked up on, it's how, I think what, <clears throat> in reading some of your articles, you specifically talk about how patriarchy um, influences policies and laws. Maybe you can unpack that a little bit, because I don't think a lot of people realize how much that's infiltrated into our system. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I'm talking about the police and fuck mm. the police here mm. and fuck the police in Egypt. Mm. But like, who do the police hurt the most? And there's a hierarchy of concern, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone paid attention when, you know, this awful, this, this terrible thing happened to Sarah Everard. But when do they pay attention when it happens to black and women of color? Never. When do they pay, pay attention to what the police does to people of color? They're now telling you resist arrest. Are you fucking kidding me? Do you know what will happen if you're a person of color and you resist arrest? Oh my God, they, they kill people of color simply for existing as black and people of color. And now they want you to resist arrest? This is just fucking madness, you know? But, but it, it, it's, it's instructive because then it allows those who have been the least hurt by patriarchy, and in this instance, or, or in, in this case in the UK, a white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, it, because then it shows you how it works, because it worked against the most perfect of victims, Sarah Everard, but people recognized it as horrific because the people who least expect to be hurt by it were hurt by it. So, and, and this is also why it's much easier for patriarchy over here, and it prefers to do that, to point to patriarchy over there. So in the United States, for example, women were always told, white women especially, you should be grateful you live here and not in Saudi Arabia. Oh yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, they are building a theocracy in the United States that is as lethal and, and on the global stage, worse than the one in Saudi Arabia, because you've got Donald Trump, 
voted for by white evangelical fundamentalists. You've got the Supreme Court packed with white evangelical fundamentalists. And they don't just impact the United States, they impact the entire world. And so when you're telling people, be grateful that you don't live in Saudi Arabia, but you're, you're basically creating mm. a, a patriarchy right here. People are not paying attention to the policies that patriarchy does, like banning abortion in Texas and about to destroy reproductive justice and reproductive rights in the United States, because it's created by a patriarchy that looks like them. You know, it's white women who see white men creating a patriarchy and they think, ah, it's okay. It's my father, it's my husband, it's not okay. Because nothing will save you from patriarchy, but they think their proximity to that patriarchy and its power will, will protect them. Nothing will protect you from patriarchy. So patriarchy is in finance. Patriarchy is in the funds that are being taken from domestic violence shelters. Patriarchy is not telling you that intimate partner violence, which has spiked during the pandemic, is a form of terrorism. I don't use the word terrorism against anything other than intimate partner violence. Absolutely. Because it is, is a, it's a political act of violence that is designed by, it, by its very nature to terrify you into changing your behavior. That is intimate partner violence. And when you look at statistics for incarceration, other than, of course, alongside with the, the racist ways in which black and people of color are incarcerated at much higher rates, did you know, especially in the United States, I think your, your figures here will be similar, that if a woman murders her partner, and it's usually in self-defense, very few women just up and get up in the morning and go, I'm gonna murder him. But if, if a woman part, uh, murders her partner, most often in self-defense, she gets something between six to 12 years in prison. If a man murders his partner, very often, very least likely not to be in self-defense, they get two to six years. Yep. For every 1,000 rapes that happen in the United States, only five end up incarcerated. That's patriarchy affecting policy Absolutely. and laws. Absolutely. So how then do we apply uh, the seven sins now that we're coming out of this pandemic? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go first, because I'm, you know, I'm, my work, I'm known for, the, for leading the anti-female genital mutilation campaign. Uh, by the way, language is so powerful. Mm. I don't even use the term FGM anymore. For mm. me, touching a child's genitalia is a sexual assault. By taking a knife is a serious sexual assault. Yes. So how then mm. do we apply the seven sins to that, you know, by, by, by highlighting FGM? Because, because of the pandemic, no one's talking about FGM anymore. And, and every 11 seconds, a girl is being mutilated. That's not considered pandemic, but that's because it's mainly affecting black African children. Yeah. And it's a current stats that shows black Africa, the black African girl child is the most vulnerable human being in the world. Yeah. So if I had to use- The octopus. The, the octopus. So She's need, the one in the middle. Absolutely. And, so and then how do we apply? How do we use well, that's this it. manifesto? That's where I start, Leila. Mm. That's where I start. I yeah. start with the black girl child. Yeah. Because when the black girl child is safe yeah. from that octopus. Yeah. When she is free from that octopus, we are all free. Yeah. That's it. And, and thank you for the language. I think it's so important because so many women in my extended family have been cut. Yeah. Egypt is the country in the world with the highest number of women and girls who have been cut. Many people are shocked when they hear this. Yeah. But statistically speaking, yeah. according to the, to the population and the number of women and girls who have been affected, the highest in the world. But so often because of racism, Absolutely. people think, oh, this just happens to black girls. Mm -hmm. And this isn't to diminish the, the fact that a, the black girl child must be the first to be liberated, but it's a way of letting Egypt off the hook yep. and, and maintaining this racism. Do you know what I mean? No, a lot of people say to me, I go there for my holidays. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. And it happens, <laughs> exactly. No, a lot of British people, it was a, uh, a big holiday destination until a couple of years ago, but yeah. literally a lot of people don't know because it's associated with black skin color. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's a way of perpetuating racism. Exactly that. So look, I think it's really important to recognize that this pandemic mm -hmm. is a fucking disaster for women and girls and queer people. Yeah. It's truly a fucking disaster. Mm -hmm. And we're just now emerging, and the ways that we will emerge, my biggest fear as we emerge, is that we're going to be told, because it's already playing out number-wise, like in the job market in the US, the people who have lost their jobs at the highest rate are black, indigenous, and women of color, mothers of color, and the people who are getting their jobs back at the highest rate are white men and white women. And we are going to be told, as we emerge from the pandemic, as we're always told after disasters, after wars, after all of these things, just as they did after the Second World War, ah, the men need the jobs because the men are the, uh, are the providers. Women need to go home now and have babies. 
Mm. And when you look at who, who are the two most powerful countries in the world, it's the United States and China, right? Mm. They are now going through the sharpest decline in birth rates in decades. And in the United States, they're obsessed, especially with the decline of white babies, the white replacement theory. And in China, they're obsessed with the decline in Han Chinese babies, which is why they're punishing Muslims in concentration camps, the Uyghurs in concentration camps in China. So when you look at, at China and when you look at the US, it's basically a form of supremacy. And I, I tell people, we are not, those of us who have wombs, we are not walking wombs for white supremacy or hand supremacy or capitalist white supremacy. Mm -hmm. We are not. I, my, my body refuses. I'm child free by choice. But I, I refuse on every level to, to offer my body as this, it's, it's always a proxy battlefield in the civil war between patriarchies. Mm -hmm. Because there will be the civil war between the US American patriarchy and Chinese patriarchy. So this is my concern as, as we emerge from this, this pandemic now. And, we, and, and it is, there was always this pandemic of violence against women, girls, and queer people, and no one paid attention to it. Where's the vaccine? Where's the vaccine against the 30% increase in intimate partner violence during the pandemic? Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. There's a fucking plague outside yep. and you're getting the fuck beaten out of you inside. And how the hell do these men who beat their wives and children, how the hell do they go to sleep at night without wondering, you know what? She's in the kitchen all day. She could just stab me to death when I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. She's in the kitchen all day. She could just poison my food. These fuckers mm -hmm. don't even think that we will <laughs> fight back. Do you know what I mean? So it's time to fight back. This is where violence, I'm hoping we're gonna talk about violence because I want to put these fuckers on notice that we're not only going to fight back, but I want you to be terrified. Not the people in this room, because I love you all. But I want you to <laughs> take this message, tell them, Mona said, be terrified. <laughs> be terrified. Because we're fucking not taking it anymore. Enough. How can you fucking beat someone up at home when there's a plague outside? What is wrong with people? How is this happening, you know? I feel, so, like, I feel like Mona's sensing my energy because that was going to be my last necessary thing we were going to come to. Violence? Why violence? Why is it necessary? So go. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, they were guarded. I think I answered your question. Like, it's, like, it's like she's reading my, I'm like, she's reading my notes. Well, look, so violence, you know, I, my first line, the first line in my book is I wrote this book with enough rage to fuel a rocket. I have enough rage to portion it out. Anyone who wants some rage, come talk to me. <laughs> I'll give you some. But. But you know, I wrote the book very soon after I did something that kind of completed the circle of four-year-old Mona waving her ship ship at the man, um, the flasher, and 15-year-old Mona, who was just so ashamed at being sexually assaulted, she didn't know to put out you know, the shame on the men who sexually assaulted her. And then something happened in 2018 that was just fucking brilliant, <laughs> because um, I started hashtag MossMeToo, to honor Tarana Burke, who started saying Me Too in 2006, and remember that this is a black feminist who started Me Too, yes, not right. white actresses who spoke out against, and it's very brave. Thank you. It's very brave that they spoke out against Harvey Weinstein, but remember Tarana Burke, and Tarana Burke has been saying it for black and girls of color since 2006, because she wants us to focus on the girls and women and queer people who can, who least have the privilege to say Me Too. So I wanted to create a space for women of Muslim descent to say me too by talking about the kind of sexual assault that happened to me during pilgrimage. Because in February of 2018, someone told me about a young Pakistani woman called Sabika Khan who had been subjected to sexual assault in Mecca, very similar to the way that I was. And I was like, fuck this shit. How is this still happening? My, it happened to me in 1982 and I wrote about it in Headscarves and Hymens, blah, blah, blah. So I started hashtag Mosque Me Too and it went viral. And for five days, I was getting these horrendous stories, you know? This is why self-care is, is, like Audrey Lord said, self-care is an act of political warfare. Absolutely. Because when you take care of yourself, it's not just about taking a bubble bath and saying, I feel great. And it's not just about going and buying, you know, fantastic orange boots and saying, I feel great, <laughs> which I do, by the way. But It helps a little bit. It, it's an act of political <laughs> warfare because they're trying to destroy us. And in refusing to be destroyed, in claiming our pleasure, in claiming our joy, we say, fuck you, we will not be destroyed. So as an act of political warfare, I had to take care of myself after five days of people sending me stories. And by the way, the stories did not just come from Muslim women and girls. A Muslim man wrote to me and said to me, when I was a child, I went on Hajj with my family and I was sexually assaulted as a boy. So enough with this, you know what, brothers, 
We've got to protect the sisters. Ah, uh -uh. I don't want to be protected. I want to be free from needing to be protected. I do not want your protection. I want to be free from patriarchal fuckery. Because this man, as a boy, was sexually assaulted by another man. So cis men in this room, please take a really good look at your friends, at your brothers, at your comrades, and fucking intervene. Tell them to stop, because if they don't, I'm coming for them. So <laughs> five days after I started hashtag Mosque Me Too, I went to a club with my beloved, because dancing for me is, a, is my self-care. And I just wanted to just let go of all these horrific stories that, that women, girls, and this man had shared with me. And I'm 50 years old by this stage. When I was 15 years old, I was covered from head to toe in hijab. Only my face and my hands are showing. 2018, in a club in Montreal, Canada, I'm wearing a tank top and jeans. I'm 50 years old. I'm having a great time. And then I feel a hand on my backside. And I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. <laughs> Not today, Satan. Uh-uh. <laughs> so, luckily, because you know these fucking sneaky bastards, most of the time they do it so sneakily, you don't even know who they are. And they're like, who? Me? What? I saw who he was because it was a dance floor full of people dancing and it was one guy just walking away. So I was like, that's him. I ran up to him. He wasn't expecting it, of course, right? Because they don't expect us to fight back. This is why I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight back. So I grabbed his shirt from behind so forcefully, he fell. And I sat on him <laughs> and I punched and I punched and I punched. And every time I punched, I said, don't you ever fucking touch a woman like that again. And every time I thought I was done punching him, I was like, uh-uh, I'm not done. Punch, <laughs> punch, punch. At what point, these two guys tried to stop me from beating him up. And my beloved, bless him, <laughs> said to them, uh-uh, he assaulted her first, leave her. Leave her <laughs> and then when I finished punching him, I stopped and then he stood up. He adjusted, he was wearing his cap backwards, of course, so he stood up <laughs> and he wanted to look at me because he wanted to see who is this woman who just beat the fuck out of me. Yeah. And he you know, made eye contact and then I went whack across his jaw. I almost broke my fingers. And he understood that I was gonna start punching him all over again, so he ran away. <laughs> and then we went to get a, a glass of water at the bar and one of the club managers comes up to me and he's like, what happened? And I explained, and he's like, why didn't you ask security to intervene? And I was like, what are they gonna do? What, nothing. And then he says to me, he looks at my beloved, huh? and he goes, why didn't you let your husband take care of it? Hey. I was gonna beat him up. <laughs> trigger words, trigger words. So I said to him, <laughs> first of all, he's not my husband. Second of all, this is my body, I take care of it. And he looked at me like I was speaking in Martian or something. He just could not understand. And it's because patriarchy thinks that it's gonna have this negotiation with patriarchy because whenever I talk about this, and, and then of course I started another hashtag which went viral because my entire life is, you know, hashtags. So I started hashtag I beat my assaulter and again, stories from around the world. But the reason that this is important is because when I talk about this, I'm accused of inciting violence. Mm. And it's really important to understand where the violence began. I fought back. Violence has been instigated on my and our bodies for centuries by patriarchy. And patriarchy wants the other side of patriarchy, my husband, to fight back for me. Because that's, that's allowed. That kind of violence, because it enables and protects, and that kind of violence, this protects, is that negotiation over our bodies as proxy battlefields. But when we say, I don't want to be protected. I will fight back. Oh, Mona, don't you think violence begets violence? And I'm like, uh-uh. No, no, what do centuries of patriarchal violence beget? They beget me fighting back. So remember that and put them on notice because I want patriarchy to be fucking terrified. Thank you. So, so to... I, I want to I want to I want to I want to conclude this conversation because I want to give the audience a chance to ask you a question but I really want to come come to one of the I think I mean they're all important but there's one I really want us to end with it's power mm. it's power so necessary mm. well I think when, when we talk about power I think what people think is kind of like you know in the run-up so Theresa May Margaret Thatcher Hillary Clinton right and they just think oh yeah we need more women in politics and I'm like no no 
It's not about having women in politics, you know? For those of us who are cis women, just because us two cis women are, you know, each of us, again, I, as I said, not all cis women, no, cis women have vaginas, but not all women have vaginas. Just because you have a vagina and I have a vagina as cis women does not mean that we are allies. It doesn't work like that. Mm. What, what, you are my ally when you are dismantling patriarchy. You are my ally when we are fighting patriarchy. So this simple, oh, you're a woman, you have to support a woman. Well, first of all, like I keep saying, let's unpack. Are we talking about cis women? Are we talking about trans women? Are we talking about gender queer people? And who is allowed womanhood? Because that's part of the conversation. And then this simple, oh, I want to vote for, I want to vote for a woman because I'm a woman. It's not that simple. So what I wanted to do with the chapter on power was to ask, what is power? And power is destroying the patriarchy. Power is standing up against all the tentacles that ensnare us because of that uh, octopus called patriarchy. And power is the ability to look patriarchy in the eye and say, I don't want to be protected. I don't just want to vote for a woman because Theresa May wears a bracelet that says this is what a feminist looks like and, and Frida did Kahlo she? and whatever. No. Yeah, <laughs> but it's all kinds of fuckery. Yeah, <laughs> she did. Or it's either a t-shirt or a bracelet or something, you know? It's, it's about much more than having a woman because those women are what I call foot soldiers of the patriarchy. Because what patriarchy does is it owns this cake that it calls power and then it throws crumbs to us and it tells us to fight over the crumbs. And I don't want the crumbs. I don't want that because what it ends up doing is it does make Margaret Atwood fight the rest of us and tell us to be civil. Because as you heard Laura reading, fuck civility when it comes to my humanity, when it comes to the humanity of trans comrades, when it comes to the humanity of black and people of color who have been most hurt by this pandemic. Fuck civility. And so what, what the chapter on power is doing is that it's saying, Stop fighting for those crumbs because I don't want those crumbs. What I want is the whole cake and not even the cake that patriarchy has. I want my own cake. Mm -hmm. Because being free and being powerful isn't doing what a man does. That's too simple. I don't want to do what a man does. I want something much more. I want to be free of patriarchy. So what I do in the chapter on power is I unpack what power means. It doesn't mean having a woman as the head of the CIA. It serves me nothing that a woman can torture in the same way that a man can. That's not power. So what power is, is dismantling the patriarchy and ensuring that those most hurt by the tentacles of the patriarchy are the ones that we liberate and that we recognize that power, the power lies in us. That quote where you said volcanoes is inspired by Ursula K. Le Guin. And she gave this amazing speech to young women who are graduating in the 1980s where she said to them, I want you to imagine that you are volcanoes and that when you erupt, you change the maps of the world. And she said, you have, to you have to recognize the power of your eruption because basically patriarchy tells us we have no power. So you have to remember your power. You have power. Do not allow them to take that power away from you and do not accept their crumbs. Say, fuck your crumbs and, and stand in your power and destroy the octopus. Amazing. Thank you so much. I, and, and I'm... And I'm and I'm very, really happy that you brought up, you know, just because it's a woman and who has a vagina, I mean, that doesn't mean you're... Actually, I have a funny story about um, <laughs> Theresa May. Um, every time we're in a room, it feels like a scene from The Real Housewives or something. We ignore each other. We have this history of... Because um, I've been very critical. <laughs> I've been very critical of uh, Theresa May for, for many, many years. And there was a documentary about FGM that we were filming for Channel 4. And we created a six-foot vagina costume. And I had a guy wearing it. We were supposed to chase her down the streets. Um, myself and the director didn't want to mention it to the lawyers at Channel 4, but they found out, so they came and stopped us. So that's my, mm. So it's that idea of, you know, just because, I don't know, we, we biologically look the same, that doesn't mean she's an ally. So I think and, and many times when I've heard Gina talk about the foot soldier of, of patriarchy, the community I come from, that's the battle I'm in all the time. It's the women who are at the forefront uh, of, 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 of um, ensuring patriarchy continues. Because they accept those crumbs thinking that it's yeah, going to give okay. them power and yeah. protection. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm sure the audience is dying to ask a lot of questions. So can I, who's, who's, who's in charge of the sanitized mic? <laughs> Here we go. So who is ready to go over there? 
My God, this is our first question in an audience since the pandemic. It's so exciting. I think I might cry. Yeah, me too. It's amazing. <laughs> Hello everyone, I just want to say that um, tomorrow is my 35th birthday. And this, this has been a fantastic segue into a birthday like this because as a Nigerian Muslim woman, I had my revolution just five years ago. Mm. And sitting here and hearing all of this has made me very emotional yes. and I am so grateful for this platform. Now, I never identified as a feminist but I had always, can you hear me? Oh. Again, yeah. Yeah, okay. I've never identified as a feminist. I always say I'm a gender equality advocate. Mm -hmm. And that's because I wasn't fully comfortable with the negativity attached to feminism. And my question to you now is, how do people like me who are in transition come to terms with internalized misogyny. Mm -hmm. There are different ways where I think that I am fighting the good fight, but in reality, it's my conditioning mm -hmm. that comes through. Mm -hmm. So I would be grateful for some insight or tips, practical tips to how I can fully embrace mm -hmm. the woman I'm becoming. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I wish you a birthday tomorrow full of love and joy. And I'm honored that you're here on the eve of your birthday. Yeah. Um, look, I, I often tell people, you know, whenever I get a question about, you know, feminism and I'm, I'm not so comfortable with feminism or anything, you know, kind of similar to your question, I first of all begin by reminding people that I haven't always been like this. I didn't come out of my mother's womb yelling, fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> I like to think of baby Mona saying fuck the patriarchy, but that, that just wasn't the case, you know? It took me a really long time to become the woman that I am, you know? And, and that's why um, the kind of like the, the, the theme or the sub-theme or the subhead of the seven necessary sins for women and girls is feminism in 3D. And what I mean by feminism in 3D, other than that, you know, the three-dimensional thing, is that each one of the Ds is defy, disobey, and disrupt. So I always urge people to find ways every day to defy, disobey, and disrupt the patriarchy. Now, when, when we begin any kind of exercise regimen, especially when we, when we begin lifting weights, I often liken this to lifting weights. You don't go to the heaviest weights at the gym and think that you're gonna lift them, right? Because that's just not gonna, you're gonna hurt yourself. So you begin with the lightest set of weights until you work up the strength to then move on to the next and then move on to the next. This is what I want you to imagine the three Ds are like. So start off, with the, the weights that will begin to kind of, you know, exercise your feminist muscles. Because we're talking about feminist muscles here, yeah? But recognize too that when you reach the stage where your feminist muscles are ready to go to the next stage, if you don't go to a heavier set of weights, you're gonna lose whatever power that you accumulated in that exercise. So always challenge yourself. Like, form, like gather that power, make sure that your muscles are getting stronger and stronger, and then when they get too easy now for, it's too easy to lift these light weights, go to the next one. So go to another set of 3Ds that continue to challenge you. And I fully believe that this, this is how I became who I am. And just find ways of daily defying, disobeying, and disrupting the patriarchy. And it, it, you'll be amazed and astonished at just like the audacity that you, that you develop. Because I'm now 54 years old, I'm like days, if not weeks, hopefully days, away from menopause, and I'm like, oh my God, the power that I have. It's not even zero fucks that I have, it's like negative zero fucks that I have. <laughs> I'm like, bring it, you know, patriarchy. If I thought that I was destroying you before, you know, how old did you say you're gonna be? 35. 35, oh my God, wait, to, wait until you're 53, <laughs> or like 54. <laughs> so just do the feminism in 3D and always challenge your feminist muscles with a heavier set and you will get more powerful. Your feminist muscles will flex. Like the kids say, flex, next level, you know, all the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I'm gonna take one more from here, then I'm gonna go online. So there's one there, please, thank you. Okay. 
Sorry, I lost my phone. Um, firstly, oh, thank you for, for your reflections on just everything and particularly violence. Um, and it made me think of this thing where people are often like, ah, oh, violence is not the answer. And it almost always feels like you're not asking the right question if violence is not the answer. Um, so thank you for the way that you have interpreted it. Um, I have long been fascinated with the idea of like violence and knowledge and how certain kinds of knowledge um, is as a result of violence and the kinds of knowledge one can accrue from consensual violence. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested to understand sort of when you've been able to opt in to consensual violence, what are some of the hardcore truths mm -hmm. or joys that you've been able to tap into? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. Uh, b before you give up the mic, um, t tell us a little about what you mean by consensual violence. Ah. Just so that we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I guess the way one defines violence is so... Um, I think if I were to instantiate it for myself, it would be like any time where I have like necessarily engaged in like kink because it's like, oh, there's like obvious, yes. obvious violence there. Yes. Um, and, and that is often like a way that one can can think about it. Mm. Another, another way is, you know, if you are a person of color and you choose to date like someone who is white, mm. that can be a form of consensual violence, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because I wanted everyone in the room to be on the same page as us and, you know, according <laughs> to the way that you want to define it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, look, you know, one of the things that, that I go to great lengths to explain in the chapter on violence is that, you know, that most liberation movements around the world in fighting colonization and imperialism and occupation of any kind have resorted to violence. And some have been allowed that violence and others have not been allowed that violence. So we think of Palestinians, we think of South Africans, we think of uh, the Irish, we think of so many contexts in which uh, the resistance to occupation, colonization and imperialism has involved violence and who has been allowed that violence and who hasn't. Or we think of the United States where we think of you know Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and then the Black Panthers, you know? So that kind of violence people, um, sometimes reluctantly will accept, but, but they, will they will understand why it's happening, you know? And in those forms of violence, uh, women have been allowed to partake, you know? But it's really interesting just how much they've been allowed to partake, because one of the people I mention in my book is a woman called Elaine Brown, who was the only woman who led the Black Panthers. And she was asked to be the, the, to head the Black Panthers for four or five years, and then she eventually left, because even though the Black Panthers were the only um, form of resistance in the kind of black liberation that she wanted, she recognized that the misogyny within the Black Panther movement mm -hmm. was, was, was unacceptable for her and she left. And this is why I also quote the Kombahi River Collective, which were black socialist queer women who said, when black women are free, we will all be free. Kind of like the octopus analogy, you know? So I ask in my book, um, I want everyone to consider patriarchy as a form of occupation. It is the oldest occupation in the world. It's the most univer universal form of occupation in the world. And when we start to think of it in that way, then we can start to kind of make those analogies, you know, because people don't think of, of, of patriarchy as a form of occupation, but it's all over the world, it's historical, it's everywhere, and it's keeping us from being free. And when I say us, I'm not just talking about women. It's, it's basically keeping anyone who's not a man, and the majority of cis men too, if they really sat down and reflected on it honestly, you know? So I say it is my right to resist that oldest form of occupation using any means necessary, to quote Malcolm X, you know? So, and, and if women were allowed in those contexts to use violence, when it's a violence that isn't against a colonizer that we all agree we don't like, it's suddenly, no, 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 you're being violent against me now, you know? You can fight the white colonizer, but you can't fight me. And that's why I say patriarchy has to be recognized as that uh, oldest form of occupation. So I claim violence. Violence is my right because it is my right to free myself from that occupation. Now, when it comes to B BDSM and other forms of, of kink, I highly recommend a memoir that was recently published by a Palestinian American good friend of mine called Randa Jarrar. Um, my, um, what's it called? My ex is, a, uh, is a, a country. I forget what it's called. Just look up Randa Jarrar, Palestinian Egyptian American author. And she talks at length about exactly what you're talking about. She talks about the power of kink to liberate us from patriarchy's conditions and, and the, the conditions and the limitations that it, it places on our sexuality. She talks about kink, especially for bodies of color, whether they are gender non-conforming or, or cis. 
and about the, the form of liberation that kink can bring about there through role play, through consensual violence, through all of that. So I highly recommend her book. It's, she, she describes it beautifully. Now, when it comes, I, I was really interested that you said when it comes a person of color dating a white person in consensual violence, because I mean, we could talk about this forever. <laughs> it's, and, and um, it, it's a really, really important and necessary approach to talking about um, violence and sex and sexuality. So thank you for introducing it to the room. I think my biggest contribution would be to say read, uh, read um, Randa and become more flexible, all of us, to become more flexible in our definitions of violence and, and acceptable forms of violence, in rejecting even that term acceptable. When is violence my right? when I say I want to be free of that oldest form of occupation, which is patriarchy, and then kind of like taking it there. So I hope when you read Randa, that um, that is my answer to your question, because I, I think that she is exactly the person who will be best to address your, your question. And thank you for coming. Thank you. So I'm gonna, yeah. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, so uh, my question was about anger. So. Um, Basically, I'm thinking about when we look at revolutions, um, so for example, the Sudani revolution, we have so many women who are at the forefront, or you're looking at um, Black Lives Matter, mm. you have that famous uh, picture of that woman who was arrested at Baton Rouge. Yes. But the problem that I find is that with anger, we often move from action towards that anger and instead look at glorification. So I wondered um, what you would think, because I feel like a lot of the times with female anger, we glorify it, mm -hmm. instead of actually taking that anger and then using that towards some sort of action. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, how do we move away from that glorification and instead use some sort of action towards that anger? Right, okay. Thank you for your question, and thank you for reminding the room of the, the Sudani revolution, and thank you for reminding the room of women's central role in the revolutions that have happened in the region, you know, historically and in, in contemporary times. Because I think what happens, and this is one of the reasons that I wrote Headscarves and Hymens, in that when a revolution happens, we're recruited, all of us are recruited, and we're told, look, this we have to overthrow the state, you know? We have to get rid of this fascist fuck, you know? Because we're, we're all oppressed. But then when that happens, and then I say, well, what about feminism? You know, they're saying, no, 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 you know, first we've got to release all the political prisoners, we've got to end torture, we've got to fix the environment, we've got to basically fix everything, and then we'll come to you, as if we're some kind of like niche project, you know? As if like, you know, when we finished everything, ah, oh, oh, you're still here, okay, feminism, you know? And, and, and that's why I talk about the trifecta of, of misogyny or the trifecta of patriarchy, because if the state oppresses everyone, the state, the street, and the home together oppress women and queer people. So those pictures, and, and I, I, my interpretation of the, the women who are highlighted in Sudan or the woman in Baton Rouge is slightly different than yours. I don't think that the, the, the media especially highlighted those women to glorify uh, female anger. I think the media highlighted those women as a form of kind of like, ah. Oh. Women are revolutionaries too, you know? And like, oh, look at this woman who's standing reading poetry for people in Sudan, yay, women in Sudan, you know? And then it's just like, it just, it was like the same with um, the Kurdish uh, female soldiers who are liberating women from Daesh, you know? And they just became this kind of like, they, they were objectified as these kind of like sexy female revolutionaries. They got one or two pages and that was the end of it. The, these are political activists who put their lives on the line, you know, who are willing to die for the revolution, who are willing to be hurt for the revolution. So for me, I don't see it so much as glorifying female anger. I see it as objectifying female revolutionaries or women who are revolutionaries, and they should be taken much more seriously than this ob objectification. Because what that objectification does is it allows our men now to say, okay, you know what, thank you. Thank you for your service. The revolution is finished now, as if a revolution finishes. You can go home now. And we're gonna go and negotiate with the military or with the president or whatever and get what we need. And you're like, where are the women who risk their lives, you know, shoulder to shoulder with you? Why aren't they sitting on the negotiating table with you to negotiate dismantling this fascist fuckery that we all risked our lives against, you know? So this is why I would hesitate against, and this is why I call it, they would just, they just objectify women as these yeah. kind of like, oh, yay, women can be revolutionaries. Okay, let's go talk to the guys now, because they're the, yeah. you know, they're the leaders, you know? So, and, and as I, I say over and over, anger is just the, the, the junior sin. 
it has to move into action because if anger is internalized and not externalized, it becomes toxic and girls, often girls, will self-harm, they will hate themselves, it turns into sadness and shame, you know? But if, if, if anger becomes the only sin that you employ, then it just becomes this corrosive, destructive thing because it needs to be channeled into something. Channel your anger somewhere. And that's why Audrey Lord said it's, it's an energy for your engine of revolution. So don't take it inside. It's toxic, it's corrosive. Don't just use it because it can destroy you. Channel it into something like saying, excuse me, I risk my life too. I'm not just you know, a two page spread. Because you know, I love that picture of the woman in Baton Rouge, but she's a, she's a leader. She's not just a meme, you know? Mm. So I, I want anger to become that thing that we use <laughs> to ensure that our power is not crumbs, that our power is the entire cake. Right. So I'm gonna, <clears throat> I wanna ask two questions, uh, and this is from online. Um, so first question is, such joy to be able to witness this conversation today. Thank you. My question is, as we continue to fuck the patriarchy and fight for, our, to be, f fight for us to be free, how do we cultivate rest? Mm. Very important question. It really is. Yep. You know, this is where I, I, I have to really, really emphasize. Mm. And I, I love that Nana did it yesterday in her session. For those of you who are here for the sex lives of African women, I have to emphasize again and again my gratitude to black feminists. Because black feminists in the US, especially today, and I hope that black feminists in the UK are too. I, I don't follow black feminism as closely here as I do in the US. Everything from something called the NAP ministry to yes. other black feminists emphasize rest as a form of revolutionary resistance, you know? Because this grind that we were always told, you know, like you're constantly working, you're constantly chasing something, constantly, who does that serve, you know? It serves that octopus, the patriarchy. We deserve rest, we deserve joy, we deserve pleasure, we deserve to take naps. And, and I'm learning all of this, like I said, from, you know, black feminist comrades. Yep. So uh, truly my, my gratitude and, and my thanks to them. And rest is really important because you need your energy to fight the patriarchy. You need your energy so that, because as I said at the beginning, they do want to destroy us. This pandemic has, has destroyed communities from which the majority of people in this room come. Black and people of color, disabled people, working class people, people who are most hurt by the octopus called patriarchy, it is determined to destroy us. And our refusal to do that grind for that octopus is a form of resistance. So rest is absolutely essential. And it's something that I had to learn, you know? No, actually, um, uh, over the, uh, during the pandemic and then the, the uprise of uh, Black Lives Matter, my, myself and a really good friend of mine who's a writer, a feminist, Fatima Haji, we founded Safe Spaces for Black Women last year for that specific reason, because we needed a space mm -hmm. to come together and talk about our frustration, but also talk about happiness, joy, pleasure, and that's the areas we really, really struggle with. Yeah. Actually, I'm gonna ask you if you can follow us and support us, that'd be great, because this is another area again, because of this patriarchal system, these are spaces that are still underfunded, there's no resources, right. because black women are still not seen as the most, like I said, you know, literally, this is a research done by WHO, the most vulnerable human being in the world is a black girl child who now becomes a woman. Yeah, so it's really. so important. So I really love that question, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next one, hi Mona. <clears throat> uh, how do you think we forge and maintain effective allyship as feminists? By this I mean allyship that acknowledges, respects our different experiences of patriarchy. That difference is really important. I mean, I, I quote many, many feminists in Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls, but this is something that Audre Lorde talked about at length, that differences are important and that it's important not to just kind of gloss over our differences because we walk through this world in very, very different shoes. When, when I walk through the world, it's a very different experience than say a black woman who walks through the world, than say a trans woman walks through the world, than say a disabled woman, you know? And, and we have to recognize those differences not as a way to create divisions between us because this, this is part of the whole unity um, delusions, you know? Let's be civil, let's be unified, but who, who ends up sacrificing the most for the sake of unity, you know? And it's the people who are often hurt the most who then end up giving up the most for the sake of unity. So when it comes to allyship, I, I want those of us who most have privilege. So I sit here and, I, and I'm speaking to you 
with so many levels of privilege. And this isn't so that I can guilt trip anyone or guilt trip myself. Fuck guilt. Guilt is, is absolutely corrosive. Nothing is achieved from guilt. But I recognize that I am an able-bodied woman. I am a woman who has a platform, who, who has a large audience. And so many other privileges that I have assist women in a world that is horrifically transphobic. I'm queer, so I, I, I'm not going to do the... the, the cis heteronormativity thing, but I'm cis and I'm queer. So there's a bit here and a bit there. But at the end of the day, I have incredible levels of privilege that, that obligate me mm. to recognize those who have less. Because I recognize, for example, that in November 2011, when Egyptian police broke my arms and sexually assaulted me and I was detained for 12 hours, if it wasn't for who I am, I, they could have raped me and they could have killed me or disappeared me. So the reason that I am here is because of who I am, that I'm famous, that I have a platform, that when I tweeted out, you know, beaten arrested interior ministry, in 15 minutes, one five, hashtag free Mona was trending. So when we recognize, when, when we can sit and be honest with ourselves and recognize those places of privilege that we have, it's not to beat ourselves over with guilt, but it's to say who my, my dream is to have this stage as wide as possible. I often tell people when, when I want you, when, th when you think of rights, think of a room that has a ceiling that is high enough to allow everyone to stand in it, not just someone of your own height. And think of a stage that is wide enough to have as many people on it as possible. Because that, that's how we, be we can begin to think of being an ally and being intersectional, as Kimberly Crenshaw uh, coined that phrase. And that's how we begin to recognize how our privilege then can become something positive rather than something that is meant or that we end up using just to guilt trip ourselves into, I'm going to shut up now because I have so much privilege. No, be more proactive with your privilege. Make sure that you expand that stage. Make sure that you remind people of those who have less privilege and keep that ceiling as high as possible. So I think this is, uh, this is how I want people to start thinking of being an ally. The widest possible stage and the highest possible ceiling. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep the... I won't be asking any more questions because I've been told five minutes. I'm like, damn it. This is so good. For it. But I think maybe I just want to... Um, maybe if you can leave us with lasting... Just what would be the last word to this audience? Well, I, I want to say thank you for everyone who came because I, it's, it's a truly moving experience to be in a room, to see... So, look, I love the world and I love people. And you know this, this feminist killjoy thing? You know, I, I'm, I truly love people and I truly love the world and I'm a tenacious optimist. I believe in us, you know, and this, this is, I'm gonna get all like cheesy and, and you know, like touchy feeling and everything, but I truly love the world and I have missed the world and I have missed people. I really have. And all these Zoom events, as wonderful as they were in that we, can, we could talk to the world, you know, I would talk to friends. I gave a keynote to South Africa on behalf of Winnie Mandela's birthday like three weeks ago. They were all great for connecting us, but I felt like I was yelling into a hole, you know, I was like, ah! And then after it, I'm like, you see, I'm like this, yeah? After it, I'd be like, oh my God, where am I gonna put this energy? So it's like, okay, I either have to like get drunk, masturbate, get high, Fuck someone. I need some I need to do something with this energy. Where is it gonna go? <laughs> so now, now I'm like, okay, thank Get you. Get ready for this energy afterwards, guys. <laughs> I'm like, thank you for absorbing my energy because I don't have to go out there now and say, oh my god, let's go fuck, because I have all this excess energy. <laughs> Unless someone here wants to fuck. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was like, hey, hey. We, she asked in a safe space and there was, it was there, consent. consent is important. Please. No, no, th this truly this is what I want to say. I, I want to say that I love love the world, I have missed the world, and I, I love people. So thank you for coming today, and thank you for making this, I hope, a really, re a, a reminder, a wonderful, loving reminder that we have each other, yeah. that we will not allow the fuckers to destroy us, and that we will go out there and terrify the patriarchy, and to every fascist fuck out there, feminism, feminism is putting them on notice, that we will fucking destroy you. So remember, fuck the patriarchy and the revolution is my cunt. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I mean, for me, it's been such a joy and honor. I was actually saying to friends and family and loved ones, I'm like, oh my God, Mona's one of my heroes. I cannot fuck this up. <laughs> Even though we're talking about <laughs> fuck the patriarchy. So, we are comrades. We are, seriously. Thank you so much. And, 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 and I was taking notes and I was like, okay, so this is my new, uh, 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 my new manifesto I'm starting, which is the revolution is my cunt. <laughs> I want my freedom with my own cake. That's what I want. <laughs> and uh, we will not wait for unfree men to free us. That's uh, we will I, free I need a T-shirt that says that. Right? I really need a T-shirt that says that. Actually, I was telling Mona earlier that um, one of uh, TEDx talks has become my screening for dating guys. It's I get them to watch that first. And if they don't agree, we don't go on a second date. It's just not that. You know, I, I, really, I really think it's one of the best. <laughs> I love that because someone wrote to me, where is the person who said to me, I'm bringing my date? <laughs> oh, there you go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this will be. I'm, this... I'm sorry to put you like, you know, on, yes, on, like, on, on the lens here, but this, this wonderful person wrote to me and said, yeah. I've just asked someone to, on a first date to your event, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm honored and thrilled. And I was like, tell me what they say. So she came back and she said, they said yes, and like the entire world on social media. So we, we wish you both <laughs> the best. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Ho hopefully this talk will be the next screening for dates. Um, <laughs> thank you, everybody, Africa Rights and Marcella. So before we end, please do not leave the room. I would like to invite Marion Wallace to come on stage to do the closing for us. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Just wow. <laughs> thank you so much for such a brilliant event and a perfect finale to the Africa Rights Festival. So um, I'm the lead curator for Africa at the British Library, so I'm here on behalf of the library um, just to briefly thank everyone who's worked so hard to make this festival a success. So thank you to all of you for coming, all the speakers and participants at the many Africa Rights events that have been held. Um, thanks to our events team here at the British Library and all our staff who have worked on this. And, of course, to Africa Rights and the Royal African Society um, for organising such a wonderful festival in spite of the odds and both in person, which has been very joyful, and online. This is the eighth edition of the festival you've brought to us at the British Library and I hope there'll be many more. A special thanks to Marcel Akita for her hard work in producing the festival. <laughs> It's now my pleasure to hand over to Arunma Ote, Chair of the Royal African Society. I, like Marion, just say, wow, this has been phenomenal. Um, thank you, Marion. Um, as you know, uh, this is either the eighth or the ninth edition uh, of the Africa Rights. Um, even though it's only, it's less than the 10th edition, it's the largest UK celebration of the best of Africa and diaspora literary works. <laughs> what a grand finale. What a grand finale. <laughs> But also, it's been an amazing three weeks. I have to say that there's something really special about the Africa Rights uh, Festival. In the midst of it, Abdul Razak Gona was named the 2021 Nobel Laureate on Literature. And I understand that he was a guest earlier this year for the Africa Rights Exeter Book Club series. And I don't know if Marcel, Akita, Kate Wallace, and Asha Ali knew something um, and wanted to make sure that people realize what the possibilities are 
when you're associated with Africa rights. My sincere appreciation to all the authors and all of you, the attendees in person uh, and online over the last three weeks. I have to say thank you to you, Mona et al. Hawi, Leila Hussein and Laura uh, Hanna for this incredible closing. Thank you to our principal partner, the British Library. Special thanks to you, Marion, to Jonna Albert, the British Library AV team, and the unique media for the live streaming, because I know there are so many people around the world who get a chance to enjoy this conversation that Mona and Leila had, and all of the other programs that we've featured uh, online. My gratitude to our sponsors, the Art Council England, the British Council, the Garfield Western Foundation, and the Miles Molland Foundation. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our festival guests, partners across marketing and programming, with a special thanks to our BSL interpreters today, Rachel Jones and Vivi. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Vivi as well. I would also like to... <laughs> I'd also like to thank our main booksellers. And I think they're still out there. You can get more books. The Africa Book Center and This Book Love. And of course, our food vendor, Little Baobab. I didn't manage to get to them, so I didn't get my Chepjen uh, and the Pule Yasa, so I'm hoping to find them so I can enjoy some of that. My gratitude to all of our volunteers. You guys have been amazing. <laughs> and thank you to the Royal Africa Society and Africa Rights teams for a great job. Nick Westcott, Desta Haley, Marcel Akita, Beth O'Connor, Natalie Fiau, Imam Saleh, Bashirat Oladili, Anthony Lee, Vivian Dovey, Caitlin Pearson, Olivia Danso, Sonia, and all of the others that I haven't mentioned. You know I call you my dream team. You're truly a dream team. You will agree with me that the session with Leila Hussein and Mona El Fahelwi on patriarchy was eye-opening and thought-provoking. I will remember a lot that you've taught us today. One that profoundly impacted me is not even realizing that patriarchy is the oldest form and most prevalent form of occupation. Leila, at the end, you also reminded us that we can have freedom with our own cake. Yeah. I am going to go and get my book signed, so I'm delighted to announce that you can do the same right after the event. Uh, Mona El Tahawi has uh, some of the books that you can um, get an opportunity for her to sign for you personally. This is my first in-person event as chairperson of Royal Africa Society, as I was named chair at the end of July. I'm energized by what I've seen today, by the talent and the commitment. And I've seen what the possibilities are for us to change the world, those of us who are in this room today. I'm looking forward to all that we can do together to our scaling up and making more visible this great jewel called Africa Rights. And by the way, the many other jewels, as I call the products of the Royal Africa Society. So you can also join us as a member today. 
my colleagues and I are available to have a conversation with you. And I don't know if any of you is in the room. I see Nick um, and others. If you can just wave uh, so people can find you uh, and others. But there's also a stand outside. Uh, and we can provide you any information. And you can join today or later on at your own convenience. But I am inspired by what I've heard today. I'm inspired by the possibilities. I'm inspired by how we can make sure that the world doesn't return to normal, uh, as Mona told us, to make sure that we don't. And it depends on each and every one of us. And I hope that all of what you've seen over the last three weeks has inspired you in the way that it's inspired me. Thank you very much, and I look forward to our next one. <laughs>